Yo, what's up? Yo, what's up? Back at it once again. The Coast Hill Thunder kicking in for you and for yours. And um, we up here talking about um, this famous queen right here, Ida B. Wells. You know, um, we got to be Wells collection going on about how this woman, this our wonderful ancestor, who done many different things, many, many, many plural different things, and her work is not really being recognized. So I already did one book up on here on my playlist about um. Southern Horrors, which is added, going to be added to the IDB Coel's collection. And uh, this one we're going to talk about, which we're going to get into a little bit later, which is about the Elaine riots of 1919, you know, the stuff she did. She didn't suffer fools, and she saw fools everywhere, her grandson said. No, just think about that. She didn't suffer fools, and she saw fools everywhere. So she saw everywhere, she had to elevate herself above that mindset, that, 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 that type of per diem, that paragraph. You know what I'm saying? That was place. So we're going to talk about how she did that, how she came over that. Remember, you know what I'm saying? Many people, she got a lot of work out here, and her work is not really being, you know, just, but we're going to bring her back because that's what we do on my channel. You feel me? You know what I'm saying? So we're going to get down to this. Now, this we left off at on, you know what I'm saying, on Chapter 3 of the Lane Riots. You know, Chapter 1 is already... Chapter one and two is already done. We're going to do chapter three and four right here, you know, from the Ida B. Club collection. So this right here, without further ado, we're going to do it and get down into it. Chapter three, the riot. Tuesday, September 30th, a people gathered at their church at Hoosburg to hold a meeting of the lodge. The place is crowded with men, women, and children. Those who haven't paid their dues and become members were anxious to do so. A peaceful, law-abiding, hard work group in their own church attended strictly to their own business, about 200 of them. Suddenly at 11 o'clock at night, without warning, a volley of shots were fired into this free assembly. The lights goes out and those who are not killed or wounded get away quickly as possible. One white man, W.A. Atkins, is killed out in front of this church, whether by the man he is with or the guards on the front will probably never be known. No one knows how many of these peaceful offending Negroes were killed by this volley as the persons who did this dastardly deed burned the church down the next day. So no bullet holes in the walls, broken windows, or dead body of Negroes will show a conspiracy of whites to kill black people. Had this been a conspiracy of Negroes to kill whites, they would have not started by killing their own members and breaking up their own meetings, nor burning their own church. They would have been in or near some white assembly hall or home working mischief. There would be more evidence of the conspiracy to kill whites than the single body of W.A. Atkins found dead besides the automobile which brought him to the Negro church to disturb a Negro meeting and commit murder. Some excuses was necessary for their actions. Some excuse was necessary for their action. And a person capable of planning and executing such a terrible dread were not above furnishing that excuse for their actions. Or Will Atkins may have been killed accidentally by the man he was with. One of the Negro guards at the church declared he heard one of the white men say, we're killing our own man. It's because that one white man was killed in front of the Negro church at 11 o'clock that night that Frank Moore and 11 other Negroes are in Arkansas Penitentiary condemned to die. Nothing in the record showed he had any business. He had any business there. He was clearly a trespasser. For every Negro in that church agrees that without warning, while they were all in church, a volley of bullets was fire hired among them. Of those white men who were firing into the church without cause, Will Atkins was one. If it had been clearly proven, that he was killed by a bullet fired by the Negro guards on the outside is because of and in response to an attack made on the church they were there to guard. Nowhere in this land would it be unprejudiced jury since a man to death for guarding and protecting his property and loved ones from an unprovoked attack. The other white man mentioned in the record. Clinton Lee met his death the next day while he and hundreds of other white men were chasing and murdering every Negro they could find, driving them from their homes and stalking them in the woods and fields as manhunt wild beasts. They 
were finishing up a job they began the night before. As a group of Negroes ran before the mob, two shots were fired from a rifle and one of them carried, and Clifton Lee fell dead. For his death, five of the 12 men sins are awaiting death by electrocution. Yet no man in all this land of the free and home of the brave will say that a man is not justified for firing back on other men who are after him armed with shotguns to take his life. Both of these men, whose death there were men, were found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to death, were in attacking parties with crowds and other white men. If there was any conspiracy, it would seem to be among the white men to kill and drive away Negroes. Why? The Negroes have made their crop. Every one of the 200 Negroes condemned and killed and had picked or gathered in the year's crop of cotton and corn. The labor needed to plow the ground, plant the seed, chop, and the cotton and lay it by has been furnished by their toil. Some of their landlords drove Negroes off the land and had it been done by refusing to feed them, by refusing to feed them longer than forcing them to leave their crop before the cotton was ready to pick. But cotton was now ready to pick, and some of them had been picked by October 1st. It had been ginned and ready for market, and a Negro due to get his reward for his toil, and a white man determined to reap the value of it. Pause. Sorry about right here. People forget that this all comes down to the economic game. All the stuff you see a hundred years later with this Black Lives Matters and stuff like that, they're still not preaching really economics and things of that nature. Because that's what it all comes down to. It comes down to the money and who controls these resources. You know what I'm saying? Like Dr. Carl Anderson said, that's what racism is about. Racism is about who controls the resources. All right? We still haven't, we as a people still haven't really learned that lesson. Now, sorry, now they're enjoying the results of their Negro labor. And while the Negroes are condemned to die or stay in prison for 21 years, the wife and the children of the white man who committed these crimes and robbed these Negroes are riding automobiles, living in comfortable homes, enjoying food and fine clothes. The wives and the children of these Negroes are wandering from place to place, homeless, penniless, ragged, and starving, and dependent on public charity which is welfare, I call welfare back then, you know. But that shows you right there the economic game. You know, just a quick quick back in there and do it again. The wives, you know what I'm saying, the wives and the children of the white man who committed this crime and robbed these Negroes are riding automobiles, living in comfortable homes and enjoying fine food and clothing. While the stuff they took away from them, the wives and children, the men they took away from the house, you know, and put them in prison and stuff like that. These niggas are wandering from place to place, homeless, penniless, ragged, starving, and dependent on public charity. They got to break down the first unit of the organization, which is the black family. Even back then. Chapter four, their case stated. In this chapter, given the statements of these earnest, hardworking, God-fearing men, whose only ambition was to be good citizens and get it on in the world. Ed Ware was the secretary of the Progressive Farmer Household Union and had 120 acres in cultivation. Sidebar, we're going to have a video on that part of Ida B. Coel's collection, the Progressive Farmer Household Union. You know, we're going to talk more about that. As you see, this one person, he had to himself 120 acres lands in cultivation. He owned a Ford car, and while the crosser lay being laid, drove his car daily to Helen, 30 miles away, and made money carrying pastures. He says, and this is his statement, Edward's statement, on September 26, 1919, my merchants, Johnson and Longnecker, came to buy some cotton. I had just gin and offered me 24 cents and then 33 cents for it. I refused to take it, and they said they were going to take their cotton at their price. I rejected their offer and said I'd take my cotton to Helena to sell. Then they said they were going to mind me, and they warned me about it. So when they tried to fool me into, into their store so they can get me, I refused to go in, and I kept out their way. On the 29th, I went to Helena and gave my business over to an attorney so when I had to deal with them. At the same time, I went to see what Colin was selling for, and I found that at Woodland and Davidson, they were paying 44 and a half cents for short cotton. So that's basically damn near double what they was offering. You know, they were trying to get over 
About the trouble which happened the next night, Elwell said, on September 30th, on the 30th of September, 1919, we met in a regular meeting while sitting and attending our business. About 11 o'clock that night, some automobiles were heard to stop north of the church. And just a few minutes, they began shooting in the church. And they did kill some people in the church, which they set a fire and burned them, all, burned them up in the next morning. Then about 150 armed men came over to my place. And before they got there, the news reached us that they were coming over to kill me and all other Negroes that belonged to that union. And then I began to look out for myself. I went into my field about 20 yards from my house, sitting there talking to two other men about the threats that I had just received. I happened to look up and I saw a Negro by the name of Kit Collins running down the road in front of my house and followed by a crowd of white men. The Negro and all the white men were armed with guns and almost surrounded my house when the old man, Charlie Robinson, and Isaac Byrd and myself began to run. The old man was crippled and cannot run. They shot him down and took him up there and laid him and put him in my wife's bed and let him stay there for four days. Then they took the country broadcast, the county broadcast, they began to shoot down everything they saw looked like a Negro. I lost all my household goods, 121 acres of cotton and corn, two mules, one horse, one Jersey cow, and one farm wagon. All farming tools and harnesses and eight heads of hog, 135 chickens, and one Ford car. This is a true report. E.D. Hicks statement. On October 1st, 1919, after the trouble the night before in the church, they were all they were after all colored people to kill them. So we ran into the swamp. I had a hundred acres of land rented from Stanley and Moore's brothers. I had a good cup of cotton and corn on the whole place. My brother Frank Hicks worked on 30 acres of cotton and corn. I worked the rest. I brought four mules in a wagon farming tools, and all my wife's clothes. They took all that from me in the trouble. Now this is a true report from Frank and E.D. Hicks. Joseph Fox and Albert Guile statement. On October 1st, we saw 150 armed white men coming to our house, and we left the house and ran down the woods and carried our sister down into the woods with us. They came and hunted us down, and they shot at the women killing three men and wounded Albert Giles and Alfred Banks and Joe Fox. They were so thick around us. They killed one white man, and we heard them say, we're killing our own man. And they went to our house and took everything that was there. We don't know how the shooting started that night because we were not there. We got the news the next day they were going to kill every Negro they saw. John Martin's statement. I was at the Who Spears Church that night the lodge meeting. I do not know that four or five automobiles of white men came about 50 yards from the church and they put their lights out and started shooting in the church with about 200 heads of men, women, and children. I was on the outside of the church and I saw this myself. Then I ran after they started firing on the church. I don't know if anybody got killed at all. I went home and stayed home that night. Then the white people we're sending word they're going to kill all the black people. Then I ran back into the woods and hid two days. Then the soldiers came. Then I made it to them. I was carried to a lane and put in the schoolhouse where I was at for eight days. Then I was brought to Helena and I was put in jail and whipped near to death and was put in a lecture chair to make me lie on other Negroes. It was not the union that brought this trouble. It was our crops. They took everything I had. 122 acres of cotton, three acres of corn. All that was taken from me and my people. Also my household goods, clothes and all, my hogs, chicken, and everything my people had. I was whipped twice in jail. These white people know they started this trouble. The union was only for the blind. We were threatened before this union was there to make us leave our crops. Alfred bank statement. I was at Hoosburg's church that night on a union meeting and do not know that the white people came about 50 yards of the church and they got their cars and started shooting in the church on the Negroes. There were four or five cars of white men. 
I was outside the church when these white men stopped and put their lights out. Then I started sitting in the church. Then I ran some for the rest with the people. I went home and stayed in the bushes until the soldiers came. Then I was taken to a lane and put in the schoolhouse. I was there about six days. I was brought to hell in a jail and whipped dear to death to make me lie on some of me, myself, and others. I was whipped three times in jail. Also was put in an electric chair in hell in a jail and shot. I had scars all over my body to show. Now I'm sentenced to death. I did not kill anybody. The white people started to the trouble themselves. We were all driven from our homes from our crowds before this trouble started. Nine families have been driven from this place. I was on before this trouble started, and several more were driven off to other places. It was not the union that made this trouble. It was for our crops. Remember, sidebar, remember, racism is the control of resources, all right? You got to control of resources. I was working 32 acres of cotton and eight acres of corn. That was all taken from me. Also, one acre truck patch. All my hogs and all my household goods from us. All my clothing was taken and burned up. All I did in the time of this trouble was run to save my life and others. Also, with these white men came and started their dirt in that church. William Warlow's statement. I do not know that one or four, I do not, I do not know that was four or five automobile loads of white men did come. About 45 or 50 yards from the church, through Spurs Church that night on September 30th, 1919, where we were in a union service that night, and they did shoot and kill some Negroes. I was in front of the church in a row when these men came to the car and started shooting at the church, in the church, and other people, both women, children, men, and children. When white people started work, that work, I broke up and ran away. I saw them, and when they made their first shot, I went to the woods and stayed all night. I stayed until the soldiers came, and then I came to them. I had eight women and children with me to hide and keep them from getting killed. The white people sent word throughout the county that they were coming to kill all Negroes they could find. The soldiers took me to a lane, and I was put in the schoolhouse, and they kept me there for seven days. Then they brought me to a lane jail where we was whipped like dogs to make stories on each other. I did not kill no one. I didn't have a gun. Then after my trial, and was over in six minutes, some of the white men came from a lane to the jail and told me if I were to put something, something on some more Negroes, they would turn me free. And if I would just call two or three men's names that I, they, they called me to. I did not do so because that would be a story, and I would not lie on no one. I was whipped twice in jail, near to death. While they was whipping me, they had put some kind of dope in my nose. Mm. Also, I was put in a lecture chair and shot to make me tell the story of other men. This is my crop. I was working 16 acres of land, 15 in cotton, and one in corn. I was charged up to four months of groceries, $226.25. But I did not owe that much. So all that was taken from me, from my wife, and she was driven off the place. There are only three families. These white people of Phillip counties wanted to say the union caused all this trouble. It is not so. White people threatened us before the large organization in this county. They only put it up to their side. Just as fast as the Negroes laid their crops, by they was driven from their homes and farms. We were under arrest. The white people went from 100 went and burnt the church down and kept from showing up what they had done. We were taught not to kill no one. It was only us who had come from the farm, the union to farm and buy government land. Robert L. Hill did not tell us in the mean, no, no mean whatever to hire white people. It was upon themselves to make this trouble. There were over 80 men and women and children killed and burnt up in that fire. Mm. So out of, according to him, his statement, out of 200 people that was in that meeting, over 80 men, women, and children were killed and burnt up by the fire. Frank Moore's statement. On the night of September 30th, we Negroes at Hoop Spurs Church at a union meeting. Over 120 men, women, and children were there in a meeting, and there were more than four or five automobiles of white people within about 40 or 50 yards from the church stopped and started shooting in the church on Negroes and killed some of them. So I ran home that night, and the next morning, whites in the world, they was coming down to kill every nigger they found. 
so many of us would get together and we would say, and then we did so. About 11.30 that day, about 300 to 400 white men armored guns walking around in automobiles at the railroad coming to a lane to kill us. So we all ran back into the field, and just as we got back into the field, there was a big crowd of white men shooting and killing Jim Miller and his children and brother and setting them on fire. So when we saw them shooting and burning them, we turned running and went to the railroad east from there, and the white people tried to cut us off. They were shooting at us all the time. So we crossed the railroad and the public road, and there were two shots made from the colored people. It wasn't my rifle that was taken from the man who had made two shots. We were all running. I have not been shot in the whole trouble. I slipped through the back of the field to, to save my mother and little children. About 5 o'clock in the evening, there were 300 or more so white people coming with guns, shooting and killing men, women, and children. So I took the children and women and went to the woods to stay until the next morning when the soldier's train came. I took the women and children and made it to the soldier's men. Then they took us and carried us to a lame village and put us in a white schoolhouse, and I was there for five days. Was carried to a lame county jail and whipped me to death to maybe tell some story on others to say we killed white people and colored people at the church that night did not have a gun whatsoever. The white people wanted to say that the union was the cause of the trouble. It was not so. The white people was threatening us to run away from our cross before the trouble started. So the Phillips County people know they started this trouble, and they only got the army there to cover what they had done. I was working 14 acres of cotton, five acres of corn, and it was the best crop on the place where I was farming. Now, after they had taken my old father and put him in jail, and after he got his crops taken from him and everything, he was working 38 acres of land, 28 in cotton, and 10 in corn, 10 acres in corn. They did not give him any of it, so he's still in hell in the jail, and I am sentenced to death. And all I made was taken from my wife, and she was driven off the farm. They also took $678 worth of household goods from her. They did not give us a fair trial whatsoever. They would not let us talk in court. Twelve men sent to death and put 75 other Negroes on a farm, farm being in prison, for one to 25 years. They also put my wife in jail. There are a great many other women also that were whipped as well as the man. Also, while whipping us men, they put us something under our noses to strangle us. Also, we were put in an electric chair and shot to make us lie on each other. Old man Ed Coleman, 79 years old. When the trouble started at Hoosburg's church, I was at home in bed sleeping. I was living two and a half miles away from the trouble. But the Negroes running, and I was awakened from my sleep. They told me that white people were shooting into the church on them. I was afraid to death near. When the morning had come, I had seen 200 white men in cars shooting down Negroes and sent us the word they were going to kill every nigger they could find in the county. And at 11.30 that day, we saw 300 white men armed coming in, and we all ran into the field. And when we got back front of the field, there was a big crowd of white men shooting and killing Jim Member's family. We turned and went to the railroad. White man tried to cut us off. When we got to the railroad, some of them was there shooting after us. It was only two shots made from colored men. There was in the woods. There was not a life taken. There was not any life taken, whatever. We were running and made it to the woods where we hid all night. And the next day, then I came home to get my wife. She was about dead herself. When I got there, the white man went and shot and killed some of the women and children. The next day, I found her. They had taken her and went to the bushes and hid all night. And then all the next day and part of the next night. White people know they started this trouble. They did this to take our crop away from us and run us away. I was working 18 acres of land, 12 in cotton, 6 in corn. All that was taken from me, my hogs, and everything was taken from me. Then I'm sentenced to die. Fifteen heads of hogs were taken from me, and my cotton and corn. The white people taking all that, then run my wife from my home. So, you know, these are testimonies of the people 
you know, the stuff they went through during this stuff. So they was making money and everything, so they take all the stuff away. And racism, like Dr. Carl Anderson said, you know, is about the control of resources. Who control what resources? So once these people got a mind of their own and stuff like that, so no, we don't need to deal with your price that you're trying to jip us on for the higher that we pay while you're trying to undercut. I can go somewhere else and get double and warm my money for this cotton or for these crops or these resources. Once the white folks in that county see that saw that the black folks was doing that and they was being out cut, they was not going to make their quota or their money up, stuff like that. They went on a killing spree. You know, and that's one of the things that's really discussed about Ida B. Bell's work that's not really discussed. That she talks about and discuss in Southern Horrors that the white man God is the money. You know, if you really want to hit him, hit him economically where it hurts. You know, it's kind of crazy that we see riots coming down in a black community and all this black property is being taken and taken down and destroyed. You know, nobody's really discussing that. If you really watching all the stuff that's going on, nobody's discussing really the economic factors and things that much. They come out put more laws in the books, and we know there's already laws in the books. We take the laws on the book. Malcolm X taught us that. But the main thing about Ida B. Wells' work in this one, and you're going to see more in the next video coming out, with, um, you know, the next one, Chapter 5, that this is all about resources and money. It's all about economics. You know, when you got so called civil rights, they had like the march on Washington not too long ago, you know, so called civil rights leaders and stuff like that. You know, you're not talking about economics. You, you know, you're not talking about the stuff they lost and what the stuff we had. These people had well beyond 40 acres in the mule, and they still came through and got with it. You know, and that's how the game is going. We got to understand how the game is played. You know, it's not about voting, it's about economic development. People still kind of miss that stuff. Yes, the voting does protect you, but your economic development takes you a long way. And they didn't want us really being an economic developed people with a class like that. Because once again, if we took them out the picture and go somewhere else to sell our stuff, as she's talking to explain like what was the cause of the lane riots, then we leave, we up above them. We got more money than them and things of that nature. Back in nineteen nineteen, a black man having a Ford, that was a no go. Down south too? No, we don't like that. Even though the north got the same thing, you know, they had the same issues with sundown cities and stuff like that, which we discuss in other videos. But this is a Coast Gift Fund Day. You know, we're up here doing it, doing a shout out to this wonderful queen, our wonderful ancestor, Ida B. Wells. She didn't suffer fools, and she saw fools everywhere, her grandson said. You know, she got to elevate and put your game on a whole new different level. I hope y'all like this video. We'll keep on going with this Ida B. Wells collection. Um, you know, subscribe to the channel, donate to the channel. I know I've been kind of slacking on this because, you know, other situations in life. But uh, yeah, much love to you and yours. Peace.